biggest hope that we can do uh, at Sight and Sound is to create an atmosphere where people can come and have an experience with Jesus. Like, that's what we want them to have. We want them to come. We want them to have an encounter with the God of the universe that sees us, who sees the individual person. Welcome to Truth, Love, Parent where we use God's Word to become intentional, premeditated parents. Here's your host, A.M. Brewster. If you've been with Truth Love Parent for any length of time, then you know that my family and I are passionate about Christian theater. And yet, we haven't really gotten around to having a show about it. Well, I am overjoyed to say that on today's show and the next, we're going to finally talk about Christian theater, acting, entertainment, parenting, and how your family can be built up in Christ via the medium of Christian theater. And to do so, I think I found the best special guests I could find. Back in episode 199, Your Child's Bungee, The Nature of Sin and Parenting, I introduced the show by telling everyone about my family's experience at Sight and Sound. My wife and I have always known about Sight and Sound. Uh, Being in Christian theater, you can't not know about them. Everyone knows about them. And though we had seen maybe one or two of their performances on DVD, We never really got around to seeing them live on stage until a couple years ago when we saw Moses in Branson, Missouri over Christmas. And then last year, we were in the D.C. area and decided that we absolutely had to just stop what we were doing and go see Jesus. So we and my in-laws traveled to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it was awesome. In fact, later that year, my fam and I had a chance to see the musical The Lion King live on stage. You know, that's supposed to be like the number one. You have to see it if you consider yourself to be a serious theater goer kind of experience. And it was amazing. But all throughout, my wife and I just couldn't shake the feeling that the shows that we had seen at Sight and Sound, both in Branson and in Lancaster, far surpassed what we saw there in The Lion King. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about why that is later on. I want you guys to really get a vision uh, for what this experience is like. But today I have Katie Miller joining me, who not only works behind the curtain with uh, the leadership and management teams of Sight and Sound, and who serves on the board of directors for the Sight and Sound Conservatory, but who's also been on the stage side of the productions, and who just so happens to be the oldest grandchild of Sight and Sound's founders. So, you know, it's basically running in her veins. (laughs) That's quite an intro there, Aaron. <laughs> I feel like I have a lot to live up to now. <laughs> well, you know, but I also have to say this, though, too. She's also married, <laughs> and she, she and her husband have three children. So, you know, they understand not only the theater side of things, but they also understand what everyone that's listening to the show understands. We're going through parenting things, and it doesn't matter what our professional lives are like. We've got family. But again, I don't want to steal any of her thunder. I have set her up on a pretty high pedestal. So welcome, Katie. Thank you. Please tell us about yourself. I'd love to hear all the important things in your life, you know, like like how much you love baking and and (laughs) blogging and, you know, the nitty gritty. Who is Katie Miller? (laughs) Who is Katie Miller? Yes. Well, baking is definitely, you know, pretty much up there because carbs are life. So let's just get that part straight. (laughs) That's where everything starts. (laughs) And um, and you need that in theater. They need those cards. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But no, um, yes, I have three children. My oldest is 13 um, and my son, Reagan, and my daughter, Anna, is 11. And then my youngest, uh, Colson, is six and just started first grade. So I'm kind of like you're catching me right as I'm transitioning into a new season of Um, all three of my kids being in school full time and uh, just sort of very excited about what the Lord has upcoming for not just me, but my family as a whole, as we just kind of are in what feels like a very different season. And uh, married to my husband, Brian, we met in high school. We were high school sweethearts, got married a year after we graduated high school. Very cool. Um, And most of my world has been sight and sound growing up here and uh, serving in many different capacities. And so um, it's a full life and it's one that I'm very grateful to have. Lots of um, actually never, ever boring. <laughs> There's always something going on. And it's never, when you have three kids, nothing's ever boring. But No, no, um, it can't be. You know, you combine three kids and live theater and live theater that has animals and live theater that has animals and is your family business and all of a sudden it's, um, there's never a dull moment. Yeah, and you're, I mean, your whole family has done the stage thing. I mean, if I, if I remember correctly, you've been on stage. In fact, you, how old were you when you started? I was four years old when I was on the Sight and Sound stage for the first time. <laughs> okay, so four years old. And your kids have all like, aren't they like fourth generation? Yeah, so my I'm the oldest of the third generation. 
and my kids are the oldest of the fourth generation. And my two oldest kids are currently some of the kids in the cast of Jesus and um, have been doing shows for the last few years. So they are um, kind of continuing uh, on in a very, their childhood looks very different than mine. The scale was much smaller when I was on stage. Um, But it's very fun to just um, see them on stage with cousins and friends and other actors and actresses that we have and just um, how that has enriched their lives um, as they've continued to grow older is just uh, it is just really remarkable to watch and be able to identify with um, on a very personal level. Oh, yeah, because you had those experiences. Now, the largest audience that Sight & Sound can host for a single production, how big is that? Um, so both of our theaters in both Lancaster and Branson have 2,000 seats in them. So we are okay. able, when we're maxed out, just over 2,000. Um, and we typically here in Lancaster do 11 shows a week. So um, we're you know upwards of 22,000 people in a week that we're able to welcome through our doors, which is just um, mind-blowing from where we yes. came from, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, my, I was, you were saying that about your kids, and I was thinking my son, his first legitimate stage experience was in a uh, sacred play and the auditorium seated over 2000 people and mm. he's like three or four years old. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, man, you know what? The, the first time I was on stage, I, it was like, you know, for a Christmas cantata with 200 people, you know, yeah. but wow, that's, <laughs> Yeah, 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 our kids are spoiled. What in the world? Yeah, well, and I don't know that they know the difference. You know, like when I was a kid on stage and uh, at our original location, which was a six hundred seat theater, standing there, it might as well have been ten million. I mean, I, you know, when oh, yeah, you're yeah, four, yeah, you know, it's just a lot of people. <laughs> and even for my kids, I don't think they like they have also grown up not really knowing any different, and so. You know, for them, when people are like, wow, you're on stage in front of 2,000 people, it's funny. They kind of always get this glazed over look like, yeah, like that's that's what it is. I don't know. That's (laughs) That's my my life. life. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. It's kind of funny. Tell us about your grandparents. What what was the what started Sight and Sound? Their story is just uh, incredible. And every time I get the opportunity to tell it again, it kind of just um, I don't know. It never loses its the parts about it that are so special. So. My grandfather grew up as a Lancaster County farmer and thought he was going to be a farmer for his whole life. Um, And when he was 17 years old, um, his family experienced a series of tragedies and ended up losing the family farm. He was engaged to my grandmother, and all of a sudden he found himself as a newlywed um, without a vocation and trying to kind of make ends meet and find his way. And he had always had a bent towards creativity. He remembers, um, you know, always for Christmas and birthdays, asking for art supplies and opportunities to take uh, for camp. He wanted a camera very badly growing up. And so he um, began to use his creativity to make ends meet. So he was um, painting landscapes here in Lancaster County. He would go around and knock on doors and go to families that he knew that had farms and say, hey, can I paint your farm for you as like a legacy um, item for you? And then they would say yes, and he would go ahead and do that. And that's how he was making ends meet. And he began to um, actually pedal paintings out of the back of his car. Hmm. And as he fell in love with landscapes, uh, he realized that he needed a way to take reference photography, so he invested in a camera. And as he began to fall in love with photography as much as he did the actual painting and artwork, um, that began to open more doors for him as well. And one summer, uh, his pastor at his church said, hey, Glenn, we're looking for something to do for families on a Sunday night. Would you and Shirley mind uh, bringing some of your photography that you've been doing as you've traveled throughout the country and doing a slideshow for uh, for the church. And, you know, this was back in the 60s, so it, there was not, you know, we didn't have Netflix. That was not a thing. <laughs> and so uh, doing a slideshow was a really big deal. And so they um, narrated it. They put music to it. Um, he kind of created his own, like, cross-dissolve uh, feature. He was very, He's very entrepreneurial and uh, inventive in many different ways. And after that one night of doing that slideshow, um, they began getting requests from all over to just, hey, can you come to our school? Can you come to the civic organization? Can you come to this church? And um, over the next of the the next few years, as they began having uh, their first couple of daughters, they were both on the road almost every single night uh, doing these slide projections, and they both started to get really tired. And he often says, like, you know, I, I looked at Shirley one night and I was like, you know, do you think we could get people to come to us because <laughs> we're getting <laughs> tired of splitting? You know, you take this daughter, I'll take this daughter, we'll go to these separate places. And so they did. They uh, rented an auditorium at a local college here in Lancaster for a summer. 
and sold out almost every single show for the summer. And wow. it blew their mind. And it what was such a blessing was that the um, amount of finances that they were able to raise for uh, throughout that summer was just enough to put a down payment on a plot of land and build their first theater. Hmm. And so um, in 1976, we officially opened what was at the time the Living Waters, the Sight and Sound Living Waters Theater. And we operated that um, all the way through um, the early 90s until we got to the place that, um, you know, demand for the shows was outpacing the capacity of um, of that location. So we built another location about a mile down the road uh, in the early 90s. And um, it seemed like we were kind of on the path to, OK, we got this. Like, we have this theater. This is what we're doing. Um, and we had just premiered Noah. So up until the mid-90s, we had been doing review-style shows and, um, and you had been a first... part of it by then, obviously. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All through. Yeah. I was born in the eighties. I'm, I'm a child of the eighties. So <laughs> <Lucky> <laughs> uh, you. all throughout my childhood, <laughs> yes, had been on the stage. And, um, in the mid nineties, we premiered for the first time, our first full length, huge scale biblical show, Noah. And, um, it was kind of this moment for us as a family to go, oh my goodness, like this is the thing we're called to do. It's Bible stories. Like all of our shows up until that point had had a ministry focus, but, um, seeing the reaction of the audience to be able to be sitting in the middle of the arc when act two opens and be inside the story that they had, you know, grew up with, cherished, read in their Bible books and their storybooks and all the different things, all the different ways they've experienced Noah audiences. The response was just completely remarkably overwhelming. And we all kind of as a family, I mean, I was, you know, 12 years old, but still we had this moment of going, oh my goodness, this is what we can do. Like, this is the thing we can do that's different than what we're seeing everywhere else, what we're experiencing, what people can um, come and get from sight and sound that they can't get everywhere else. And so for us, it just felt like, okay, we, we, not that we have this figured out, but we, we have this figured out. And then it was only um, a year after we premiered that show that we had a tragic fire at the theater and lost everything. (laughs) Um, and, um, yeah, it was a turning point for us in our history that at the time felt like the end. Um, but in hindsight, looking back, it really was the beginning to set the stage for where we've grown today. That is so amazing. And I, I've seen on DVD, uh, productions of Noah and it is amazing. And I want to talk about what the experience is like, but not, not quite yet. We're going to hang on to that for a second. (laughs) That's all right. Um, But I actually did uh, a very small um, Christian theater in uh, Illinois area. The director Mm -hmm. wrote their own story of Noah, but it was inspired in many ways from our staging and whatnot off of what you guys had done. So that was actually the first time I had had a chance to see it because she was talking about how how impressive and how amazing uh, that performance was and, and how it really pulled everyone into the experience of Noah. And that inspired her to write her script for Noah. So I got a chance to see it then. And yeah, at, wow, so, so amazing. And I just want to take a moment here really quickly to encourage all the listeners right now to join us next time, okay? Because Katie's going to come back, but she's also going to bring her friend Brandon Talley. And he's been playing the role of Jesus in their current production that uh, we've rest- referenced here a couple times, and it's called Jesus. And among other things, we're going to talk about some of the benefits of getting your kids involved in theater. Now, obviously, there are some potential struggles, too, that come from when you you get your kids involved in theater, and we're going to talk about that as well. But then we're also going to hopefully talk about how teaching your kids the theater arts can help be a big part of dealing with unique parenting issues. It's kind of strange. You might not even think it would be intuitive to to say that, but it's true. There are some amazing experiences. So we hope to do that on our next show, and I hope you guys uh, hope you guys join us for that because I'm really excited to take this idea of Christian theater and and step away from entertainment and inspiration and really try to make it practical in our families how it can actually help us to parent better. Uh, so definitely join us for that. Uh, Katie again will be back, and so uh, we'll be joined by Brandon. But I want to now kind of just transition a little bit so we can kind of have a better idea, Katie, of what you've been doing. You've been on the stage and you, there was, you know, we kind of left our story with this, this fire and it's seeming like the end. Um, talk to us a little bit about what happened next. To talk to us about what, where the theater went and how you guys came back to life in a way. And then talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing in the past, you know, since then. I know you've done some, a lot of stage work, but you've also done a bunch of stuff from corporate communications manager and all this, um, the member of the brand team and whatnot. So let's talk about that. Sure. 
Yeah, so um, it was 1997 when the fire happened, and at the time, my grandparents were in their 50s, and they just, um, you know, to be completely honest, they weren't sure that they wanted to come back. It felt like an just completely overwhelming undertaking um, and not necessarily being certain that they wanted to at that stage in their lives. And they talk about the infamous kitchen table conversation. That's how we lovingly refer to it. But (laughs) it was three days after the fire and it was the first moment um, in three days that they had uh, time alone. We'd had constantly people, their house um, is only about a mile away from the theater here. So their home had become the hub of all of our displaced offices and um, a leadership team and management teams as we were just trying to say, oh my goodness, where do we go from here? And it was three nights later, they sat uh, down together and my grandfather looked at my grandmother and he said, Shirley, do you want to come back? Like we're 55 years old. We've been working really hard our whole lives. What do you want to? And um, my grandmother is definitely the quieter of the two. And she, uh, he always says, you know, she sat there for a few minutes and then she looked at him and she said, Glenn, if we don't come back, I don't think I could live with myself for another day. This is more than just the thing we do. It's the calling God has put on our lives. Mm. And in that moment, they said, okay, whatever it takes, we're going to come back. And so um, my grandmother, after that conversation, went up to bed, but my grandpa decided uh, to go out to his office. He had an office in the corner of the barn that's right outside of their house. And um, he sat down in um, in his, what we call his milk house office, <laughs> it's in the milk house part of the barn, um, and began praying and actually stayed up all night long and sketched the exterior of the theater um, as it exists today. And it is remarkable. We still have that original sketch. And when you hold it up beside a photo, I mean, it, it looks like it was done the other way around that you sketched the exterior of the theater. It is um, wow. an exact image of what he sketched out that night. The architects used it as their um, main point for their design work. And we were able to miraculously, I don't have time today, if we could do a whole podcast on all the things that the Lord did uh, through that season, but we were able to miraculously open with our existing theater here in Lancaster 18 months after the fire. Wow. Wow. And we premiered again with Noah. Yeah, it was just, wow. it was completely, um, the way that the financing came through, the architects came through, it just, um, from start to finish, it was a miraculous season for our family's lives. And it really did, even for me, you know, I was 12 years old when the fire happened and, um, I hadn't known any other life than sight and sound for the most part. I had been homeschooled. Um, all of my friends were at sight and sound. It was the hub of my family. We were all here. And so for me in w- one day to watch, you know, what was my life at the time, what felt like my life anyway, um, burn and just kind of have that uncertainty of the future and then see God's faithfulness throughout it. It was just such a, um, I don't know. It was such a special time for me just as a, budding teenager to go, oh my goodness, like, I think God has a plan in all of this. And if he has a plan in all of this, he has a plan for me too. Whether my plan, you know, intersects with sight and sounds or not, there's a plan that he has for me. And, um, I ended up going to high school, uh, throughout, I wasn't homeschooled anymore for high school and did different things at the theater throughout that season. Um, worked in concessions, worked in, uh, the box office and, um, in our guest services areas. And then from there, uh, worked in the contact center, uh, taking reservations, making phone calls, um, and then eventually worked with our human resources department, doing events for our employees, and serving our leadership team in an executive assistant capacity for a few years. And most recently, um, I have been a part of our brand development team, um, just partnering to continue to um, grow this thing that is sight and sound that we are all very passionate about um, and being able to partner very closely with our marketing teams and brand director creative teams and have just um, been loving it, especially the last couple of years. It's just, it's been so fun to watch um, this place and this organization that I love so much and the people here uh, grow into what it has become today. That is so amazing. So amazing. And I love the the passion and the fact that you've had all of these experiences. You've, you've worked in every different arena. I mean, did you have a chance to make those amazing spice almonds? <laughs> I, I <mean>. did. <laughs> I spent <laughs> many a years roasting yes. almonds. <laughs> now, before we move forward, I do need, I want to go back to something you said. So your grandfather sketched out the, basically the exterior. Did it include that iconic lion and lamb? Um, it did. I now I can't say for certain. Now I'm like trying to picture it in my head if the original sketch had the lion and lamb, but I believe uh, it was only um, a little bit after that that he would have put that on. We opened with that lion and lamb in place, put it that way. So it's been yeah. there since we opened. 
Yeah, and and having gone to both of the campuses now, I, and having seen it's like it's like an identical building in both places. Uh, yes. and the, a landline is out there, and it's it's so great, so great. Okay, so we we referenced the almonds. Now, <laughs> I'm actually not a huge fan of almonds myself, but when you walk in to a sight and sound, you you see the spectacle outside. This massive building, this giant lion and lamb. It's so great, and I love that right from the very get go. Uh, everything's pointing to the Bible, pointing to Christ, pointing to the glory of God. It's so amazing. But once you walk inside, you get smacked in the face with probably <laughs> the most delightful aroma known to mankind. It is, <laughs> it is so amazing. And it's these spiced almonds. Is that like a proprietary blend? You guys make that there? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess so, because it's not something that we necessarily publish. But yeah, it's funny. Like we started roasting those, I think, right after we opened um, the theater here, right after the fire. And they have become um, one of the most famous aspects of the complete sight and sound (laughs) experience. And it totally cracks us up because... um, it, you know, even when we post photos on social media, we'll be posting all of these beautiful, epic shots of the shows and, you know, we'll get a lot of really great interaction. And then we like post a photo of almonds and it goes viral. And we're like, what yes, just happened? Yes. You know, <laughs> like That's people exactly are coming here happens. for, you know, the almonds and the show is like a fun little side part of what they come here for. <laughs> I, well, I heard once of this ice cream shop and everyone loved their water. Their ice cream was so good. It made the water taste good. I'm just going to say that everything else you guys do, yeah, is so amazing that it makes the almonds taste that much better. It just has to work that way. It has to work that way. Yeah. So we went to Branson. It was uh, during Christmas. My family, my parents were there and my in-laws were there. And so, and my family of four were there. Uh, Our kids are uh, very close in their age. My son is uh, almost 13. My daughter's almost 10. And uh, we were, and it was amazing. The first time we saw it. Uh, we saw Moses and uh, the production was just so huge. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of stage work. I, I did stage work at Bob Jones University and they have mm-hmm. a massive stage there. Yeah. And um, But the stage was huge. Like you can't see it, the whole thing from side to side. You got to turn your head unless maybe you're sitting in the very back row of the balcony. You might be able to see it from side to side, but I kind of doubt that. Um, and you guys have come to a place now where you, you've got the technologies where The sets, not only is the set design absolutely gorgeous, but what adds more gorgeousness to it is the fact the way the set moves. Because changing from scene to scene, these it's it's not just like, oh, we have to get this out of here and make room for something else. It's an experience. It's an art form just to watch the sets move and to see the the digital backgrounds that are used in some situations. Mm -hmm. It is so amazing. Help us, help the person who's never seen this before kind of get a picture in their mind of what they could expect to see unravel in a sight and sound production. Well, one of the things that we are most known for is that panoramic uh, stage and the experience of feeling like you are right in the middle of the story. You know, it is, um, we don't have to do a lot of adding to these biblical stories. You know, they are Mm -hmm. epic by themselves. So Mm -hmm. whether it is Moses and the parting of the Red Sea or Samson and a temple collapsing or, um, you know, even just all of the story elements throughout through the stories of Jesus where Peter's walking on water and Jesus is clearing the temple, there are so many spectacular elements to the stories. The thing that we are passionate about is um, bringing them to life in a way that our guests that come, our audiences that come, feel like they are truly part of the story. And more than that, um, we want to continue to do these stories justice. Like they deserve a big stage, you know, they deserve uh, to be as big as what they were um, when they really happened thousands and thousands of years ago. And so, you know, for us, the 40 foot high set pieces and the live animals running up and down the aisles and the LED screens and the thousands of lights and all of the different special effects and technological things that we the use angel to of tell death the stories. flying the angel, over the yes, audience, the angels that fly, all the things that happen, um, they really come back to telling the story, the messages in the story. And there is no greater um, compliment, I should say, that we ever get than when we hear from audiences and guests that come and they leave with their families and they write us a note later and they say, you know what? We went home and as a family for the first time in a long time, we sat down and read the Bible together. We sat down and we wanted to know, like, was that really in the story? We didn't remember that. And so whenever we hear that we inspired people to turn back and go back to scripture themselves, for us, that's what it's all about. That's the thing we all get up every day to do. The Bible is just, you know, so full of life 
um, so full of things that are relevant to today. And we want people who may not think of the Bible that way to walk out of our doors going, oh my goodness, I never thought about scripture that way. And now I want to check it out more for myself. And that's exactly, exactly what it did for my family. We actually listened to an audio of the entire book of most of, I think most of the book of Exodus mm, in mm-hmm. preparation for seeing Moses. Yeah. Um, because, because that's what it's all about. It's all about the scriptures. And what you guys do is you take the scriptures and you literally put us right smack in the middle of it. And you put us into the middle of it in such a way that it's so it's so real. Like you don't doubt it. The the writing is fantastic. The acting is fantastic. The music is just pitch perfect. It's exactly what it should be. It's it's one of those things sometimes you listen uh, to, to music in a, in a production and you're like, oh, that was nice. It fit there. But this is music you want to listen to at home uh, because it's so, it's so perfectly uh, sums up the whole point of the whole narrative, the whole theme of that particular scene within the story you're telling. It's just really pulls you in. Yes, the animals help. I love the animals. My daughter loves the animals. You got these camels and everything going everywhere. You got even these little animals like rats. Like you yeah. have to be paying attention. <laughs> yeah, and, right. and this one, this one scene in 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 Moses. If you weren't looking, you'd miss the fact that this rat would run down this banister and go into this spot. And then later you have another one over here. It's like, they're training rats for this. This is fantastic. (laughs) Yes, we have a just completely ridiculously talented team of people. Between our two locations, we have over 650 employees that all work together, whether they are training animals or writing shows or building set pieces or sewing costumes, um, cleaning our facilities, welcoming guests. They're all bringing the, the thing they're designed to do that all comes together to create create this whole experience. And, um, you know, the details matter, like God's in the details. So for us, Mm -hmm. the set pieces, um, having the detailing and animals, not just the big ones, but the small ones too, Mm -hmm. all of those things add up to creating an experience that you don't necessarily walk away being able to articulate how all of the things wove together to tell the story, but they really do. They contribute. And, and look, here you are, you know, like what, five, three years later talking about the rat and Moses. So (laughs) exactly, exactly. (laughs) Now I I talk about the rat, but I also have to talk about Rodney because what was really cool is that we, saw Rodney Coe, who was, I think, playing Aaron at that in that yes. production mm-hmm. of Moses. And then we went to Lancaster years later and we saw Jesus and I recognized the voice. <laughs> it was... Um, well done. Yes. That's impressive. Oh, I recognized the voice. And what was so cool, and I, you talk about people doing everything well and you know, putting throwing their energies into it. Um, my wife, we were the last ones to leave the theater. We were just loving it and she's getting pictures. And Rodney, photo bombs. He played... Um, <laughs> he played who would he play in Jesus? Um, it was, uh, one, it was he Nicodemus. Played Nicodemus, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he played Nicodemus and he photobombs her picture. And then we get into a conversation and and he's telling us his testimony and yes. we're sharing things and we're talking and yeah. we're laughing and we're crying in the parking lot. We're praying <laughs> together oh. in the parking lot. And but that was just an extension of that was that was a perfect end cap to the day because the beautiful thing is. You know, we sat down and we sat down next to a complete stranger, right? Yeah. But this man who was sitting next to me is also a Christian. And so immediately we're brothers in Christ. We've Mm -hmm. never met, but we have this connection in Christ. We're here to see the story of Christ and we're talking and we're encouraged. We ended up exchanging emails and having a back and forth after the fact. I mean, a guy, (laughs) a random guy is sitting next to in a theater. We, We emailed back and forth for a while and we're encouraging each other. I love the fact that at the end of the show, uh, there's there's a call to a prayer. There's there's an invitation to say, you know, if anything that you heard today uh, impacted you, if you want to talk about what you saw today, and there are people down front, and and I love that that is the passion. This is not just solely about entertaining. Mm-hmm. This is about sharing truth for the purpose of life change. And I think a lot of the people uh, go to participate in that. And I love that you guys engender an atmosphere, whether it's the actors on actors on stage or the people selling the almonds or the people down in front willing to pray with you after the, uh, after the performance, you engender that atmosphere. Yeah. Well, thank you. That is an incredible compliment. And you know, it really is our, um, chief creative officer and president. He, um, is very fond of saying like my, you know, my biggest hope that we can do, uh, at sight and sound is to create an atmosphere where people can come and have an experience with Jesus. Like that's what we want them to have. We want them to come. We want them to have an encounter with the God of the universe that, um, you know, like I said earlier, parted the Red Sea, 
that led his people out of, um, you know, out of slavery and all of the different miracles that we watched happen throughout all the Bible. But he is also the God who sees us, who sees the individual person. And, you know, we try to remember our teams, you know, our, our, our shows are long, they're big. Um, our show runs are very long. And so the thing we are constantly trying to encourage our um, employees and our cast members and crew members that are doing this day in and day out is to remember that when they're looking out into the audience, yes, they're seeing a crowd of 2,000 people, but they are seeing individual people with individual stories who are here to be yes. inspired, to be reminded, sometimes to be introduced to Jesus for the first time. And so mm -hmm. um, it is something that we as an organization, um, as a group of fellow employees, all work together. Um, and to your point, you said it earlier about Rodney, like share the same passion. And um, we love hearing those stories when the experience can continues well beyond the stage and into the parking lot and and hopefully even beyond that. Oh, definitely. And they have. And we've we've told many people ourselves, we posted so many pictures and things on Facebook and we've just told people it's cool one of those times that we were I think we were at Jesus, if I'm not mistaken, a friend of ours was in Branson uh, and they were seeing Samson, maybe mm -hmm. during the same time, maybe not. And yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's a couple things I want to point out before we move on and I want to talk about so how our listeners can can participate, how they can see this. Obviously, there's going to the show, but there are other options. And I want to talk about that. But I just want to, two things that struck me. So we're going to see Moses, right? And, and we know about the parting of the Red Sea. And I'm a theater guy. I've done this a lot. I've been in many different shows. Um, and, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, impress me, sight and sound. How are you going to do the parting of the Red Sea in such a way that it's really going to you know, like feel like I'm really right there? Oh my and. word. <laughs> well, you win, I lose. Congratulations, you did it. It was so cool. And I, to try to explain what you did would completely destroy it. I just want to say to the, the audience listening that it was amazing. It was so well done. But despite the, the size of that and the grandeur of recreating the parting of the Red Sea, okay, that was amazing. I have to tell you, now I've, only, I've seen a couple of them on DVD. Uh, and I've seen it been to two shows, but the one thing that absolutely blew my mind came from Jesus this past September. And you might know where I'm going with this, but it was the cleansing <laughs> of the temple. Yes. So if you if you know the anecdote from scripture, you know that Jesus goes in and he is kicking people out of the temple because they are sinning, they are defiling the temple. He's, he's throwing people out and the animals are all being, um, uh, being driven out. And he goes up center stage, okay? This is what you're actually seeing. He goes up center stage and Jesus grabs the, the table with all the money on it and he, he just flips it. And, and what happens is that moment just, I think it sent goosebumps all up and down me. And it, if you don't know what's happening, it just, you, you can't believe what you're seeing because we see it all the time in movies, right? In the movies, all of a sudden something, something will happen and all of a sudden time will slow down to help you appreciate what it is you're seeing. But that's exactly what happened real life on stage. All of a sudden, everything goes into slow motion. And it wasn't just that the table was falling six feet in slow motion. It wasn't just that all of the actors were moving in slow motion. What absolutely blew my mind is that all of the money that was on the table is falling to the ground in slow motion. Now, I am I'm not going to give away how they did this. I, I, I had to investigate myself. I went <laughs> down stage and I'm like looking after, after the I, during intermission, I'm trying to figure out how this happened and I figured it out and it was pure genius. But being able to capture that moment, the intensity and the passion and to be able to put in that element that really was so beautiful and so amazingly well done. Absolutely fantastic. That scene, I mean, obviously the crucifixion and so many other things that you guys covered, uh, just so powerful, equally powerful. But that particularly, that that image is seared into my mind of how you guys pulled that off and it was so well done. So so we've built this up, okay? And, we, and we've and we kind of set the stage, if I can put it that way, um, for how amazing <laughs> well, this well experience is. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I feel really embarrassed that I said it. Like that, but, <laughs> That's okay. Um, I say it all the time too, like not trying. Yes. And I'm like, okay, I need to pull back on, on that one. <laughs> yeah, you need to stop setting the stage. Yeah. Um, but we want, we want the listeners to be able to get this experience. So obviously there's going to Branson. There's right there in the uh, kind of in the middle in the Midwest there. Uh, and then over on the East coast, we've got Lancaster. And if you can do that, plan it into a family vacation, take some time to, to get to those locations. You will not regret it, but how else can a family do that? If perhaps, uh, that's maybe not so feasible. Yeah, no, well, we, um, 
you know, are as passionate as we are about telling these Bible stories, about inviting people to come join us and have these experiences, we also um, are passionate about making them accessible. And we recognize that not everyone, um, as much as we would love to have everybody, we know not everyone can come to Lancaster or Branson every year. And so um, a couple of years ago, for the first time, we began capturing um, the live shows on film and then um, having them for movie theater events all throughout the nation. So we started, we did that for the first time in 2017 with our show of Jonah. And um, Jonah was in uh, 650 movie theaters nationwide, all 50 states. And it was just for us such a um, very cool moment to recognize that more people than ever we're having this shared experience at the same time. And Aaron, you referenced something a little bit ago when you talked about the community aspect of, of coming and sitting alongside others that share passion for the Bible and are having the experience with their families. And it is a big part of why we do what we do. We recognize the community aspect of it. And so uh, nothing made us more excited than when we heard of you know youth groups and church groups and school groups and family reunions and all these different things that were happening in all four corners of the country um, at the exact same same time having a, you know a sight and sound experience in their own backyards in movie theaters and so it has begun um, it has continued to be something that we do every year and so uh, this uh, we've done Jonah Moses and Noah in movie theaters and um, we have not announced what our 2020 plan is yet so stay tuned for that we'll be making that announcement in October um, but we are just excited about continuing to see where God takes us in the future, what he has for sight and sound as we continue to grow as an organization and um, provide more opportunities for um, people to have the sight and sound experience. And if you miss those events and you want to continue to um, you know, have other ways to experience sight and sound, we do have a lot of our uh, shows on film for um, both in the DVDs and then also just for digital download on Amazon and iTunes and places like that too. Yeah, and I would highly encourage that. If nothing else, definitely, you know, because in Jonah you've got you've got the, the the giant fish, the whale, you know, swimming through like like the audience is under the water. I mean, it was just so amazing. Even that, it's, it's stage productions. I can say are always better there live. There's the energy coming from everyone in the room, but the way these have been shot and the the way they've done it is such an amazing spectacle. And again, the stories, I hate using the word stories. The historical uh, accounts yeah, are so right. powerful because it's God's word and God's word does not return void. And they're true to that. And it really is a wonderful thing. Now, there's also something else you do. In fact, I mentioned earlier that you're on the board of the Sight and Sound Conservatory. Um, tell us a little bit about that, because that's another way that some people, a small handful perhaps, uh, choose to uh, continue to engage with you. Yeah, we are in our sixth year, I believe, of the Sight and Sound Conservatory, um, which is a year-long program uh, designed for raising up the next generation of students, of performers in the performing arts, um, but always from a Christian worldview, wanting it to be um, an expression of faith. And so um, it has been begun to just be such a special part of what um, our Sight and Sound family is here and one that we continue to hope to see grow in the future as, um, you know, like you, you said, it's a handful. Right now it's very small. We intended it to be a small program, but we want to continue to see that grow in the future and we're actively working towards um, continuing to make some more of those opportunities more readily available. Now we're going to talk more next time about how uh, getting involved in theater and acting and whatnot can be a huge benefit uh, to our children and can help us with um, some cool parenting experiences. Uh, but if you are already in a place where you have a child who's looking to graduate from high school and they are passionate about theater and they love the Lord, this might be something to consider that they may not have already considered uh, as they can continue you know, furthering their education in this uh, particular realm because Sight and Sound does it so incredibly well. I, I, I haven't participate in the conservatory, but I can only imagine that their, that their excellence is carrying through to that as well. So Katie, as we wrap up the show today, please share with us the best ways for the listeners to immediately get introduced to Sight and Sound. Where should they go? Yeah, I mean, the best way is always our website, and that is sight-sound.com. And you'll be able to say, uh, see on there what shows we have available, what our upcoming schedules are. Um, there's always social media. We love interacting with our guests and fans there. So we're on Facebook and Instagram primarily. Um, and that's a fun way to just get a lot of behind-the-scenes photos and um, you know, first announcements of what's coming up next. Awesome. 
So as we wrap up today, I want to encourage all of you, please, to engage as much as you can with this amazing ministry. Find them on social media. Go look them up. You can obviously start by sharing this episode so others can be introduced to them. Uh, and then hide, head over to site-sound.com. Check out all the information there. And then again, please join us next time as Katie, Brandon, and I discuss how theater can be a very practical and exceedingly helpful resource for you as you parent the way God called and created you to parent. We'll see you next time. Truth, Love, Parent is part of the Evermind Ministries family and is dedicated to helping you become an intentional, premeditated parent. Join us next time as we search God's Word for the truth your family needs today.